Good evening, everybody. I'm Dave Rothery, Professor of Planetary Geosciences here at the Open University, and on my left is my colleague Manish Patel. Yes, I'm a senior lecturer in planetary sciences here as well. And uh, we'll be finding out what Manish is up to lately very, very soon. Uh, the main purpose of this evening is to answer questions from you. Now, the people we've invited are people on S283, the Level 2 Planetary Science course here at the Open University, which I chair, the learners on the Open University Future Learn Moons MOOC, and anybody else in the wider Open University Planetary Science community. I, I know there's some people who previously studied the Moons MOOC who are looking in tonight, so welcome to the, the old hands as well. Now, if you look below me on the screen, or depending on your screen layout, you should see a couple of widgets we're asking you to vote for your favourite moon. Uh, Manish is annoyed I didn't put Titan there. But, but we're only allowed five uh, columns at most. So that's Titan's my, that's my favourite moon, and it is a good moon. Um, but w this is a request from one of the mo moons moon learners. Can we vote for our favourite moon? So I put that in. Um, there's also another widget asking you what you're studying. We'd just like to know how many of you are studying the S283 or the moon's MOOC or, or aren't studying at all, just so we know afterwards who we've been talking to so fill those in. We'll look at the very end and see which is your favourite moon. At the moment Europa is winning. Um, so and do send in live questions. I've got a iPad down here with the, um, uh, the feed in. You've all been saying hello to each other. Ask some questions and we will try to answer the live questions as we go along but there have been questions posted in advance. So we'll get to those when we've said, said a little bit more about what's going on. Now, Manish is involved in the ExoMars mission, which is very, very current, just beginning to produce data. So, and Manish is a colleague of mine on the S283 team. So Manish, tell us the news. So yeah, the uh, mission I'm working on is the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter mission, which launched in March 2016, so very, very recently. Uh, took seven months to coast through space and it arrived at Mars in mid-October. You probably heard all about that. Um, so the, the, the mission itself is searching for methane. Uh, it's searching for signs of life in the atmosphere of Mars. So it's an orbiter, uh, as you can see here, and it's also a lander. So uh, the, the lander part obviously didn't go so well, but uh, the orbiter is where I have my instrument. So I'm co-leading an instrument that sits on the orbiter and hunts for methane in the atmosphere of Mars. So here, I have a, I brought along a, a small model of, of the orbiter. Uh, this is a scale model, so it's a 1 to 50 scale model. It's not actually this small, it's actually 50 times <laughs> bigger. So here's my, um, here's my finger for scale. So it's a pretty standard spacecraft in that you have the solar panels here, you have the lander sits on top, that's this gold piece here, that's now departed and, and gone. And, and then landed a bit too fast on the surface. Yeah, yeah, it landed. It landed very, very well in terms of speed, I guess, but <laughs> not so much in terms of survival. And then we have the science instruments are on the, the main body of the spacecraft here. So we have two gold instruments here. These are the Russian instruments because this is a joint European and Russian mission. And then we have the two European instruments on this side here. And it's this instrument, which you may or may not be able to make out here, um, just on the top corner of the, the spacecraft, which is the Nomad instrument. This is the, this is the instrument that I am, I, I am co-leading. Uh, so this is just a nice image of, of it flying on its side uh, in white space, not black space, showing you where the instruments sit on the spacecraft. So this, this one, the top right, the Nomad instrument, is, is the one that, that, that I, am, I am working on. This is, this is the methane hunter, which is going to look for methane in the atmosphere of Mars remotely. So we're not going into the atmosphere. We are, we are using sunlight, essentially, to, to, to look for signs of these gases in the atmosphere. So it's, it's an ultraviolet visible infrared spectrometer. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually, it's actually three instruments uh, housed in one, if you like, three for the price of one. Uh, it's three separate spectrometers looking at, as you say, the, the UV wavelengths, the visible wavelengths, and the infrared. By looking at those different wavelengths, you can see different gases in the atmosphere of Mars. This is a fantastic way of finding out what the atmosphere is made of without going anywhere near it, doing it on a global scale. So I think in the, in the next image you'll hopefully see, you can see the instrument that we built. So this, this is Nomad. It's, um, it's 27 kilos. It's, it's fairly large, and it sits uh, on top of a table here where it's being tested with a big mirror. 
This is before launch. We have to test it with light sources, etc. And you can see one of the team members there in, in reflected in the mirror. That is now sitting uh, on the spacecraft orbiting Mars quite nicely now. Was that built here at the OU? Part of it was. So one of the three channels, the UV invisible channel, was, was okay. built by us at the OU. That's our design. That's one of the three instruments that, that's now now out there. So yeah, this is this is cutting edge Martian science that, that we're doing here and building instruments and technology that we're, we're producing here at the OU that you're, that you're seeing the results from hopefully in the years to come in the courses that you'll study. So NOMAD is obviously a, a spec spectrometer looking at gases in the atmosphere, but it's, it's not just looking at methane, it's looking at a whole host of gases in the atmosphere. So this is what we're, we're, we're planning to do for the next few years. You haven't found any methane yet. I, I can't say anything because such information is quite privileged, but I, we, we have but made some observations. Okay. Say that. But you can show us what methane would look like. Exactly. So <laughs> one of, <laughs> we have to be very careful about what we say and what we release. Mm. because uh, So one of, one of the things we're looking for is methane. Now, this is a really interesting gas because on Earth, it's linked to life. So the presence of life creates methane in the atmosphere. And pretty much most of the methane on Earth is, is produced by life. So about 10 years ago, we, we saw this. Uh, we didn't. Uh, people took ground-based telescopes, looked at Mars, and said, hold on, we, we, we're seeing some methane, we, we think, in the atmosphere of Mars. There was a lot of controversy. There was a lot of debate. methane shouldn't linger in the atmosphere, should it? It's broken exactly. down by ultraviolet sunlight. Exactly. 100 years residence time or something like that. Yep, so yep. a few hundred years few it should hundred be gone. Years. Okay. So it's really a gas that has no right to be there right now in Mars's history. Um, and yeah, and it's linked to, to life on Earth. So it raised this really, really interesting question of where, you know, where is this stuff coming from? So that was about 10 years ago, and people had fierce, fierce arguments about whether they actually saw it or not. And this is where this, this mission began, if you like, to, to try and answer this argument of, is the methane there and where is it coming from? This was 10 years ago. Missions take a while to, to build and, and launch and send there, etc. cetera. Um, so in the meantime, the NASA rover, which was at the surface, Curiosity, it did measure methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Well, it, it initially didn't. It said, hold on, there's no methane. We all got a bit worried. And then a few months later, it said, actually, hold on, there is, there is methane. There's a lot of methane, and, and it's varying. So it was great news for us, because our primary objective is to go there, figure out where this methane is coming from. Is it, is it due to life, or is it due to some geological process? Now, either one of those answers is equally important. But, um, but obviously, the, uh, the, the angle of life producing this gas in the atmosphere of Mars has its interests uh, for, for, for us. Yeah, Andrea Price is asking, will you get a, a, an emission or an absorption spectrum with NOMAD? We look for absorption spectra. So uh, we, we, we can detect emissions, but what we're mainly looking for is absorption. So we, we look at the sunlight coming through the atmosphere of, of, of Mars. And from that, we can, we, can see what we're, we can see what gases are absorbing that kind of um, that, that kind of light. And actually, I'll come to that in a second, actually. But first, I just want to show you uh, a plot of the kind of thing we're going to be. be. Okay. So there's a movie here which shows a methane emission. This is a latitude-longitude map of Mars. And we've modeled what an emission of methane would look like. Now, this is using a, a weather model, the kind of thing that we use for weather prediction on Earth. And you, we can see how any methane emitted from, from the surface of Mars is pretty, it starts to move around the surface, uh, driven by the winds and pressure waves, etc. So this is the kind of thing that we're hoping to do by, by, by from orbit, by, by looking for methane and mapping it in this way, we can build up these kind of maps and figure out how the methane is moving around. So if you saw an emission from a point source like that, you'd suspect a release of gas that had been built up because of microbial activity in the soil? Potentially, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it could be geological activity that's suddenly releasing it as well, but yeah. these are the kind of things. And effectively, what we'll be doing is mapping, creating these maps of methane, and then trying to turn that that what you saw, that movie, trying to re run it in reverse. So trying to rewind it to, to figure out the point at which it, yeah. it was emitted. That and movie was several days worth of modeling? That was 20 days of modeling, okay. yes. So 
Uh, it's a challenging, it's a challenging uh, problem, but we have postdocs. Uh, James Holmes was the, the person who's created that, and we, we run these weather models, these global climate models, to try and uh, figure these things out. So. Okay. We better move on fairly quickly, but you've, you've actually got some data to show us. Yeah, we, we've we've arrived at Mars, and actually, this is a, this is a very good time to be talking about this because we are we actually last week got data, our first data from Mars. So this is the first spectra of Mars. These are the first images of Mars. So what you're seeing here is the very first uh, infrared spectrum that we took with our instrument. So we pointed it at Mars, and uh, we crossed our fingers that our instruments survived this long journey and it, it did and it saw everything we wanted to see. So what you're looking at here is a plot of a signal, infrared signal, so infrared sunlight if you like, against wavelength and you can see these very distinct bands of absorption. So these, these are absorption bands caused by H2O, caused by water vapour in the atmosphere of Mars. So we, we were hoping we'd see the water vapour that we knew was there in the atmosphere, and it's a check to see that the instrument's working fine. And yeah, we were very happy when we saw this. Uh, we, uh, the instrument's working, it's working really well, and this is the kind of data uh, that may look a little bit boring, but this is the stuff that really, really makes us happy when we see it, because we're, we're seeing these gases, these trace gases in the atmosphere, and everything's working really uh, well. It looks good data, there's no obvious noise there to my eyes, so that's great. Yeah. But Let's have a look at some of the pictures from the other instruments yeah. and then we'll, we'll move on. So the, the camera also took some fantastic images of Mars as we swung by close to the equator, very, very close. And these are, these are some of the first images. These are the first images from Mars, from the ExoMars spacecraft. These are hot off the press, quite literally, from yesterday. So yeah, This was released by UC yesterday. And, and, and the label's coming on now. The top one is panchromatic, then there's a red, a near-infrared, and a blue image. So that's the four cameras recording in three narrow wave bands and one broad wave band from yep. which they construct the colour pictures. Yes, exactly. And it also gets stereo by looking at the same area. Yeah, so the the, these, swivel. these are the people taking lots of data and lots of measurements. And here you've got a stereo reconstructed image. So by, by looking at the same point from two different angles, you can create these kind of 3D models of the surface, which is fantastic stuff. This is, this, is, this is a really high resolution, 2.8 meters per pixel. That we, 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 flew, we flew past the surface much lower than, than, than our actual final orbit, ironically. So we get these really, really fast close-up images of Mars, which are just fantastic. That is spectacular stuff. So that's a ridge with slopes either side. One or two impact craters going by, but not many. So it's clearly a young, active yep. surface. No surprise. A dark streak there? Yeah, yeah. Potential activity there. Yep. Intra very, very interesting stuff. Then you see the scale bar here is 500 meters yeah. down there in the corner. So yeah, these these are fantastic images that we just got. Well, there's a there's slow streak, streak coming but these streaks are where moisture might be seeping out and making the dust go dark. They're ephemeral in many places, yes. aren't they? They appear yep. and disappear. Yeah. What can you tell us about Hebe's Chasma? Yeah. The detail here is really, really nice. This is, this is the kind of detail that we need to see to, to, to interpret what's going on at the surface of Mars and hopefully link it to, to what we're seeing in terms of methane emissions, etc. So these are isolate. These are valleys with plateaus in between. Yeah, it's a fascinating planet, isn't it? Rim of filled crater north of Da Vinci. So this is the f this just shows the, the 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 huge vast amount of data we've got from our first orbit of Mars, which is just utterly fantastic. So we're going to be doing this for the next few years on Mars, which is going to be great. So keep your eyes peeled for lots of great data to come. Yeah. Look forward to it. But that's enough about uh, about what I'm doing, David. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what you're up to? Well, I'm working on a, a different planet. I'm working on Mercury, which you can see. <laughs> Behind, <laughs> which shoulder? <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> That's a geological map of part of Mercury produced by some <laughs> Italian colleagues of mine. Um, Mercury is the smallest terrestrial planet. It's airless. It's got a very long and complex geological history, though. And we've had a NASA mission called Messenger, which was orbiting it until April a year and a half ago, uh, it then ran out of fuel and crashed. And we're sending a European-Japanese joint mission called BepiColombo, which is launching in 2018. And I'm leading the surface and composition working group for the European Space Agency. And one of our 
goals is to get geological maps of the whole planet to set the context context for the Bepi Colombo measurements. I mean, the different colours on there show craters of different ages and uh, lava fields of different ages. And the big round feature at the bottom right-hand corner is the largest impact basin on the planet. Basin on the planet. That's the Caloris Basin. And uh, in front of me here is a provisional version of the geological map that's been made by um, a student of mine called Jack Wright, who is the other facilitator on the of an educator, as we must say these days, on the Moon's MOOC. So some of you will have seen comments from Jack. This is his map in progress. The pink area is young lava flows. The brown area is older terrain. And the yellow stuff is ejected from relatively young craters. And this map is, is yet to be completed. But, but this is Jack's PhD project in progress. So we're trying to map the whole planet. There's 15 quadrangles that the planet's broken down into. And between the Italian and the British and some German and American colleagues, We'll get it done well before we get Beppe Colombo there. And then when we get the Beppe Colombo data, we'll have to remap it again because Beppe has a broader suite of instruments. When does the Beppe Colombo mission get there? Beppe will get there in 2025, so it's, it's a long time yet. It's the nature of space exploration, I guess, isn't it? We can't get to Mercury anything like as quick as you can get to Mars yes. um, because it, you have to arrive there travelling slowly enough to be captured into orbit. So it's. A, it's rocket science and it's, it's, it's a slow process. But let's go on to your, your questions and we'll, we'll begin with some questions which came in advance. So there's a question here from Janie Yu, who's a learner on the Moon's MOOC, and this is really one for you, Manish. So Janie asks, a large underground water ice deposit has been found at middle latitudes on Mars, as reported last week. Jenny wants to know your comments on this finding and questions that she can think of so far are do we expect to find more such deposits on Mars? Does this finding change our estimates for Mars's potential for hosting life? And will the existence of such a deposit expedite the plan for manned missions mm. to Mars where you could set up bases? That's a fantastic uh, question, Jenny. Uh, really, really topical and really, really uh, important important in our understanding and exploration of Mars. So uh, your first question, do we expect to find more such deposits? Absolutely yes. Uh, every time we look at Mars, we see something new. We see something really interesting. And you know, we, we, we first went to Mars and we saw ice at the polar caps. It's like, OK, there's ice at the polar caps. Then we suddenly started seeing more and more ice. We suddenly started seeing below the surface at higher latitudes. We saw it very close to the surface at higher latitudes with Phoenix. And now we're seeing it at these mid-latitudes. So it seems that every time we look, we see more. And that just comes down to the fantastic instruments that we're sending to Mars now and the fantastic um, research that's being done to interpret these measurements. So I, th I fully believe, yes, we're going to see more and more of this stuff uh, the further we go. And how is it being detected? It's using radar data from uh, an instrument called the Sharad instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this it's looks... ground-penetrating radar yeah. that goes through the dry soil and finds the ice surface yep. and measures its thickness as well. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it looks for the, the interface between rock and ice and water, liquid water, and then from that you can figure out the, the depth of the ice layer below the surface. And this is a fascinating one because we've found a very thick layer of, of ice, talking up to I think uh, 150 meters or something like that, very close to the surface, so b within one or ten meters of the surface, so within reach. Um, really, really interesting, and not up near the poles, but in the mid latitudes. So the kind of places that we can get to. So this is this is really important for um, for exploration. Uh, in terms of life, that's a bit harder because uh, we need liquid water for life, and this is very much ice. This is frozen ice, so it doesn't help so much in that respect. But it is good because the water is there; it's just in the wrong state. So mm -hmm. we're halfway there. The real, the real question, the real implication is, is, is this exploration that you mentioned at the end. This is where the big change occurs, and getting people to Mars is, is what we want to do next. It's what NASA wants to do next. It's what ESA would like to do. If we send people there, we need resources like uh, ice. We need water. We need it for to mm. keep people alive. We need it as a source of fuel to get back. So, anywhere we go has to have these kind of deposits. So. It may not expedite such missions to Mars, human missions, but it makes it possible, which is, is really, really good news because we all want this to happen, hopefully. 
except at the moment you're not allowed to send people to places where there might be life because of the risk of contamination. So you can't send people to where there's water. Yep. <laughs> this is an interesting <laughs> paradox. I was just, I was at NASA for a meeting to discuss this, planetary protection for human missions to Mars. Mm. How do you protect a planet from uh, contamination when we're going to be sending these massive biocontamination reactors that are human beings. Um, so it's a really, really tricky one to, to, to encounter. I don't think we can go with, under the present cost bar planetary protection rules. And they have to be changed or the, else we never go. And that, that's the intention, is to, is to update them, mm. especially taking into account commercial exploitation as well. But a really fantastic question. Thank you very much for that. It was really nice. So um, we, have, we also have a question from... Christine McCallum, who is an S283 student. Uh, thank you for your question, Christine. Christine asks, uh, Dave, uh, if, if you'd like to answer this, what determines the number of moons a planet has? And therefore, for any given exoplanet, can we predict whether it will have moons? And if so, how many? There's not a straightforward answer to this, Christine. I mean, you'll have noticed that the nearest planets to the Sun, Mercury and Venus, don't have any moons, and the Earth has only one. Now, the first moons discovered beyond Earth were at Jupiter, and there were four moons that Galileo discovered. Yep. And then the next moons, moons to be discovered were at Saturn, and the, and the total went to five. And it was Earth one, Mars none, Saturn five, Jupiter four. So it looked like a pattern of going increasing numbers away from the Sun. and. Um, Jonathan Swift suggested Mars must have two. Well, various <laughs> people suggested, but Jonathan Swift wrote it into Gulliver's Travels way before they were discovered, because Mars's moons are tiny. So then you had one, two, four, five going outwards from the sun. There seemed to be a pattern, but that's completely broken now, because Jupiter and Saturn have over 60 each, and there are 20 or 30 at Uranus and Neptune, and mm. even Pluto's got five. So basically, Christine, Close to the sun, it's very hard for a planet to hold on to a moon because the planet's sphere of influence is, is swamped by the sun's closeness and proximity, really. Large, dense planets, well not dense, large, high mass planets like Jupiter and Saturn and hang on to large numbers of moons. And the, the smaller gi <coughs> giant planets, the ice giants, I uh, haven't been able to capture so, so much material. So I think basically it's size and mass that matters, but too close to the sun, you can't hang on to moons. So it's not a, not a straightforward answer, really. Dave, you're saying size matters, right? I'm saying okay. mass matters. <laughs> what, one of the really interesting things I, I'm, I'm... I mean, this, this concept of exomoons and uh, moons <coughs> around exoplanets in other systems, and it's redefining our understanding of habitability as well, because you can have these really real hostile environments where uh, these close-in gas giants around planets. But if these if these planets have have potentially have moons, and may have subsurface environments, and this is a key thing. It's yeah. these moons, as in as in our solar system, these moons may be able to have habitable environments yeah. below the surface where it's protected. There are hot Jupiters that have migrated close to their stars. It's not clear if they could hang on to any moons that they originally had during yep. that migration, or once they got there, would they still hang on to them? So yep. um, we don't yet know. No exo moons have been discovered yet, mm. but yeah, we have colleagues here, <laughs> we have people who are trying to find them. It's not, they're not straightforward things to find. Yeah. Maybe indirect means, but you know, there are people saying within a couple of years we'll have found our first exo I moon. I think the rate at which the research is going, I think we are we are on the cusp of something yeah. good there. I think. Let's move on. We've had a Mars question from Michelle Pilker, who's a learner on the Moon's MOOC. Um, so since it's Mars, you can have first crack at it, Manish. Michelle says, what would the theoretical mass of Mars's Moon need to be to cause tidal heating of Mars's surface? And would that tidal heating cause liquefying of Mars's core and eventual creation of a magnetosphere? Okay, to do that, it would have to be a pretty big moon. Uh, so, uh, what's the best way to answer this? The, the, the moon, for example, does impart a tidal force upon the Earth. Clearly, we can see that in the form of the waves, etc., that, we, that we're all familiar with. But there's a difference between tidal force and tidal heating, I guess. Uh, so a moon like Io, as you may well, I'm sure you know, Io is uh, intensely active because of the gravitational field of Jupiter. 
it's stretching and squeezing the planet and creating this, this tidal heating within the planet. And that's what makes it geologically active, volcanically active. But there you've got a tiny moon Io and you have a huge planet Saturn. So um, Jupiter. Jupiter. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Uh, so you've got this huge mass that's the, that's stretching stretching the moon. Now, that's the kind of mass you need. You need something much larger than the body that's, uh, in question to create that kind of force. So uh, Mars has two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos. Um, these are very very small moons. These would have to be huge. You need, you'd need a moon what the size of size of the Earth to start getting anything appreciable. Yeah, and then it would be Mars would become a moon of the Earth rather than the Earth being a exactly. moon of Mars. I mean, you get tidal heating from any moon, but <laughs> only an infinitesimal amount. Yep. You know, to, to, to really warm an interior up, you need a very strong tidal interaction. Yep. Um, we've had a few live questions come in, so let's move on to those. I'll give you a couple at once. They're all to do with uh, what you've been talking about, Manish. Um, Paul King is saying, do you think the methane detected could be seasonal? I'm not sure, uh, well, are you looking for seasonal effects in methane? and? Uh, at the same time, perhaps you can answer Andrea, are you determining depth, fr depth profiles in Mars's atmosphere? Or how deep is the methane that you're seeing? I in guess? the atmosphere? Yeah. Okay, I'll, uh, two, two great questions actually. So, first one, spot on, we're actually looking for seasonal variations. By that we, 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 we mean we're looking for how these things vary as a function of time. So we're, we're going to map it and create this, this latitude, longitude map like you saw, but we're going to follow that through in time. So we're going to map that, we're going to cover the globe every few, few days, and we're going to carry on doing that for the lifetime of the mission, which is a few years. By doing this, we can, we can figure out and monitor and look for seasonal changes, because these are the things that will tell us exactly where the methane is coming from. So that's exactly, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it's no good just going there and measuring it once and saying, right, it's there. You have to, you have to do this long-term seasonal um, measurement to try and figure out where it's coming from and really answer the question. The, uh, uh, Andrea, the second question about depth is, again, really, really pertinent because what I didn't mention is that we're looking down and mapping this stuff to create a latitude-longitude map like you're all familiar with, but we're also... Every orbit, we watch the sunrise and the sunset through the atmosphere of Mars. So. Uh, this gives us, so what we do is we look at the sun and we let that line, we let the sun pass through the atmosphere from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. And by taking the spectra then, we can actually directly measure the vertical profile of the methane in the atmosphere. So we will get those depth profiles, those vertical profiles at ultra high resolution. And, and that again will help tell us where the methane is coming from. And while you're on a roll, Jonathan <laughs> Schulster is asking, how do you calibrate NOMAD at Mars? Do you kind of correlate against data from Mars Express instruments? Uh, you can, but they don't really do the same thing that we're doing. So what we have to do is calibrate it on the ground. It's a really, really intense process, and we spent a lot of time doing this before we launched, uh, you know, working 24 hours around the clock. For, for months just to get this thing done and you've got to test it you've got to test the hell out of it before you launch it basically this is the only way to do it um, luckily one of the channels we can actually we can actually flip to look at the sun so we can use the sun as a, as a calibration source but the others we, ha we have to test it on the ground essentially we are planning to cross compare with other missions so the NASA missions the MAVEN uh, MRO and also Mars Express as well it will give us an idea of where things sit, but the, the true calibration has to always be done on the ground, really, before you launch. OK. Let's move on to a question which came in um, in advance. Uh, this is from Peter Smith, who's on the Moon's MOOC. He's pointing out, many craters on the Moon appear to have light-coloured rays emanating from them, sometimes for hundreds of kilometres across the surface, while most of them radiate from the centres of the craters, Many of them, especially from Tycho, appear to radiate tangentially from the edge of, from the edge of the crater. What's the explanation for that, please? Now, I, this had never dawned on me before, um, so I had a look, and I've got some images to show you. So here's the full moon, and Tycho is that crater in the, southern, in the center of the southern hemisphere, and really. you can see the bright rays coming from it. The youngest craters on the moon have these ejector rays. These are fresh, powdery material, it, with time, as space weathering goes on, they'll fade into the background. 
Tycho's a young crater, and yes, if you look at the ray at about the seven o'clock position, it's coming from the edge of a crater, not from its, not from its centre. If we go to the next picture, which is a closer up view, you can see the rays aren't quite so clear in this rendering, but you can see them more clearly, and that seven o'clock ray doesn't trace back to the middle of the crater, it traces back to part of the edge of it. I mean, on a broad scale, the rays are radial, but in fine detail, they don't all trace back to the middle of the crater. And I, I looked into this in the literature, and it is a recognised phenomenon. And the explanation boils down to the process of spallation, S-P-A-L-L-A-T-I-O-N, spallation. Uh, it's really just the way the surface is fractured by the shock waves that propagate outwards from the point of impact. Now, there isn't a good explanation, it's just an observed fact that the rays don't all come from the middle of the crater, some come from places on the edge. And I suspect it's to do with fractures in the, in the, in the basement, in the bedrock. Um, that, uh, that are pre-existing or inhomogeneities in, in the bedrock, but it isn't a well-understood phenomenon. And it, nor is it confined to the moon. I went and found a similar crater on Mercury. If we go to my, my final picture, here's a crater called Beck. This is 30-something kilometres in diameter. It's smaller than Tycho. But again, there are ray, there's a ray pattern that's centred on the crater, but if you trace individual rays back, very few of them go back to the middle of the crater, a lot go back to a, tangentially to a point on the rim. So thanks, Peter, for pointing that out. Which, um, I, I wasn't aware of this phenomenon. Did you ever come upon it, Manish? No, we, um, we often see oblique impacts, so impacts at an angle where you get all manner of, of, of strange asymmetric uh, ejector patterns happening. But um, yeah, no, that, that's certainly an interesting observation, a very astute observation, Peter. Yeah. Um, we're getting some more live questions now. Uh, Carol Lister is asking, are there any serious plans to return to our moon in the near future? Uh, well, the Chinese have a live mission, I think it's still live, Chandrayaan-3, um, on the lunar surface. The Chinese have a pretty active mm. plan for lunar sample return, and a lot of observers are saying they'll have um, Chinese astronauts on the moon in ten or are you sceptical? Um, no, they they. It's very different to how do we do things. They just decide and then do it and throw loads of money at it and it's done. Uh, there, there's no politics slowing things down, I guess. There and they they have a point to prove in terms of they want to show that they can that they that they are serious players in the space in the space travel uh, there is area. A, the crowdfunded initiative uh, Lunar Mission One which m many of us are supporters of, which may try to send a, a mission to the south pole, the region of the moon, and drill 100 metres to get samples and put a repository of human information down the borehole. Yeah, that's certainly ambitious as well, I think. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, these are all uh, concepts that are happening and they're, they're developing now. And the Russians as well, they, they have a lunar programme which is, is still continuing. They, they plan to go back in the early 20s, I think. With possibly European Space Agency mm. uh, support as well. And there's people here at the OU working on that. And yep. the Indians have lunar orbiters. Yep. yep. Uh, when the next humans will visit the moon isn't clear. I put my money on it being Chinese people rather than anybody else. I suspect. Yeah, I suspect so, yeah. Um, so there's lots going on. You can get to the moon so relatively easily. It's still mm. dangerous for people. Yes, and as a, as a stepping stone to other places as well, it's certainly being considered yeah. for the well, future. While we're there, why don't we take this question we were saving from the end? It's on a similar theme. Flutura Lamke from Tirana. What's your position regarding the fact that no one's gone to the moon for decades, and what about conspiracy theories? Is there some truth in them? All the conspiracy <laughs> theories are true. It's all a no, 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 no. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> um... The fact that no one has gone to the moon for so long, that, that's always a tough one. I guess, for me, we went to the moon for the wrong reasons before. The space race was fantastic in getting us to the moon, getting the Americans to the moon. That tension between Russia and America was great. It meant that we got there so quickly. The problem with that approach is that once you get there, once you've done it, once you've proven it, once you've beaten the Russians there, then 
actually, they, you know, there was no reason for them to stay. There was no reason for them to carry on. And this is where you need the science exploration, to, the, the slow burn to keep you going, build it up slowly over time, and build um, a foundation for the future of exploration. Yeah, but the conspiracy theories, I mean, dismiss them. You can find all <laughs> kinds of rubbish on YouTube if you look. <laughs> but at the time the Americans landed, their most serious competitors, the Russians, never expressed any doubt that they'd achieved it. Other space agencies, spacecraft in orbit around the moon, have seen the Apollo landing sites and seen traces of the landers. Yeah. Um, and the rock samples brought back, which tally with lunar meteorites subsequently recognised. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, there's, there's all the proof that you need. But I mean, we, we did go to the moon. We we have uh, we have we have rocks here that we've analysed here in the mass spectrometers at the university, which can only have been produced or, or their origins can only be from the moon. The the, the chemical the, the isotopic composition is not of this earth. Quite literally, it is that which is known for the moon. So. Uh, I'm certainly convinced because I've, you know, we've seen the rocks in the lab and we've seen the measurements that come directly off of them. So, mm. yeah, forget about the conspiracy theories. Yeah. Let's deal with some live questions. Phil G is chipping in about tangential rays. Says, what about the rotation of the moon in the time between impact and the time the ejector finally hits the ground? I think we can dismiss that, Phil, because the moon takes a month to, to rotate and impact crater formation, crater the size of Tycho. It's over within a couple of minutes, and, and, and the ejector is deposited very quickly as well. Yeah. These are hypervelocity phenomena, so good idea, good suggestion, but that's not going to work. That's not the explanation. Sridif Ramesh, how probable is finding life on Europa? With the current knowledge we have on the conditions in Europa, what formal stage of life would be likely to be found there? That's an interesting one. That's a really interesting one because um, in, the, in the realm of astrobiology, which is the search or the, uh, the, the pursuit of understanding life beyond the Earth, so astrobiology quite literally, many people consider um, Europa and these icy moons, Enceladus, etc., to be actually maybe more probable locations to find active life even more the, so than Mars, some, some believe. Yeah. So. I don't know if you realise what's yeah. over your left shoulder. It's, um, it's a, a large copy of our Moon Trumps card about Europa, where we said a prob potential for life is 50%. That's, that's our I don't guess. Know this is yeah. the card game they play in the Moon's MOOC. <laughs> and we gave Europa a higher rating than Enceladus, where I think we gave it 30%. So, uh, there you go. So, um, Moon's Mook learners will be familiar with, uh, with these cards. So, Europa <laughs> and Enceladus, the best places for, for life amongst the icy moons, because they have subsurface oceans. They both now are known to have active plumes intermittent on Europa. Yeah. Um, a persistent on Enceladus, so we could even go there and sample the life without landing on the surface. So they are good exobiology targets. Absolutely, and you know it, it, you, you have this you have this heat source inside the, the moon, so you have energy. You have uh, you have liquid water. You have nutrients from from the rocky interiors, so mineral uh, mineral mineral nutrients, and you're protected from the really harsh environments around you know the the radiation fields around. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So it, these are looking like really, really interesting places to go, and they are the, they are the subject of future missions. We have a, a mission called Juice, which is the uh, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission, which is going to go to go go to Jupiter. It's going to explore Ganymede. It's going to explore uh, Europa and try and figure out what's going on there at the surface. The, the, the aim is to one day get down below that icy surface and try and sample that liquid ocean below there, hopefully one day, see what's down there. Absolutely, because if life on Earth is likely to have begun at hot vents on the Earth's ocean floor yep. at a time when the atmosphere is completely different to today, you don't need sunlight to support life, you need chemical energy 
those conditions are there at the water rock interface inside Europa. Yeah, it's fascinating. Once this, you know, not long ago actually, this was a stupid idea, the idea of, of life beginning down below the surface away from the sunlight. Everyone thought you had to be near the sunlight, but yeah, as Dave, David says, these, uh, the, these, these hot vents that people have found at the bottom of the ocean on Earth are teeming with life and they've never seen sunlight before. So. Um, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great discovery on Earth that lets us find life potentially elsewhere in the solar system. Yeah. We're running out of time. I think we can take one more live question, which is coming from Jonathan Schulster. Is the influence of the Moon on the variation in the spin axis tilt of the Earth over time uh, unique uh, to the Earth-Moon system due to the relative size? and all that the Earth has only one moon. Okay, the moon is said to stabilise the Earth's axial tilt. The Earth's seasons are because we're tilted at 23 degrees relative to our orbit, and that tilt has only changed by a few degrees over hundreds of millions of years, whereas Mars, that's Mars, that globe behind us, Mars's axial tilt has changed a lot more, not having a large moon to stabilise it. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the lack of a moon means that... Um, <laughs> this is Mars. Uh, currently, we, we're, we're, we're like this, at a 20 similar degree, tilt to the Earth, similar yeah. to the Earth. But over time, it has very much gone like this. And that's solely down to the fact that we don't have a moon stabilizing the Earth, like Dave, David says. So a very, very good question. And it actually <laughs> links back to these ice deposits Right at the start, we were talking mm. about these ice deposits. The reason they are there, people believe, is exactly because it has no moon. Because back in the ancient past of Mars, when, when it was tipped over on its side, uh, because it had, didn't have a moon, this, this axial spin was dipping down and varying a lot. When it was down on its side, it would have been really cold in the equatorial regions when it was tipped over, and then it swings back, etc. And this is when they believe the, the ice could have been deposited in that region and how it's persisted to, to now. So that's a really nice question, actually, that brings us full circle it does. Uh, to where we began. Well, that's a, a good place to, to draw to a close. Before I do that, I'm just looking at the widgets, but what's your favourite moon is very evenly tied. A lot of you have said you'd be voting for Titan if it was there. <laughs> <laughs> what instrument did you work on on, on Huygens for Titan Lander? That was the surface science package. It was the, the piece of the lander that touched the surface of Titan for the very first time. It was a force sensor that touched the surface. Okay. This was the creme brulee detector. Yeah, I, that wasn't my fault. That no. wasn't my fault. But yes, that's something I worked okay. on whilst actually whilst studying my undergraduate degree. So similar to what some of you guys are doing. It was a fantastic opportunity to, to, to work on that it and then carry on in my PhD It as found well. a res uh, suddenly yeah. after that, yeah. hence the creme brulee idea. Exactly. Now it's said to be a pebble that it hit first before. Most likely a pebble yeah. that it hit and then sk skipped away. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we haven't got votes for Titan. I'll read the results. The Moon, 22%. Io, 22%. Europa, 27%. Enceladus, 20%. Sharon, 8%. And I wonder how it would have changed if Titan had been there. And uh, there are 15 of you studying 283, 22 on the Moon's MOOC, and others studying something else or not studying at all. But whoever you are, hope you've enjoyed it. Come back again in March. Um, if you're a 283 student, you'll be directly invited. If you're on the Moon's MOOC, well, that will have long since finished, but you'll still find out about it if you join the uh, Moon's Facebook group or follow the hashtag, which by then will be hashtag FLMoons. 17 because yep. we'll be in a a new year so Manish thank you for your time and joining me thanks to Kate and Ben uh, for making this all work uh, in the back room and uh, thanks for joining in and uh, see you again thanks bye bye <laughs>